the crux for the real estate investor looking to develop land is, you know, how can I maximize my density when it comes to rental real estate because density equals cash flow. say an investor is entering a market and you know they want you know the best investment on their money and they're you know they're going through the market they're seeing multiple neighborhoods and they come across a house that's within an HOA um to somebody like me what even is an HOA and how does that affect their investment decision it's it's a great question right and and what's an HOA and let's even take a step further back from that I mean like what other possible governing authorities do you even have to deal with when you're investing in, a, in an area, right? I mean, because you've got an HOA, and that's a pretty obvious one, right? Sometimes that, that's a monument, and you know you're pulling into an HOA community because it's a named community around you. But did you know you've got a bunch of other possible constricting factors on your neighborhood, too? You've got, you know, you take it all the way back to the fact that you've got certain zoning laws that dictate what you could actually build on any given piece of land in any given city, right, or, or area, right? And from that zoning, from that, that land use plan that was put together many years ago in the cases of most large cities, you've got all kinds of regulations that come down from that, from you know, code enforcement regulations that require what you can act, how you have to maintain that property, to deed restrictions that are put in place by builders, to homeowners associations and community development and dis- districts, and then all kinds of municipal codes and local codes that that affect what you can do with that property. So what we're dealing with here, Donnie, is a really complex issue uh, that involves many, many different authorities and plans that are going to affect you if you're a real estate investor. This is the kind of episode where I think it could really scare you if you're if you're inclined to be scared by things. Because there's a lot of players that can affect your real estate, and I think we should touch on some of them today. Yeah, you may uh, you may think that you actually own something when you buy a piece of land or a house or an investment property, but buyer beware. Uh, what you actually own and what you actually have control over can often be called into question and can be prohibitive in some cases. Um, But in some situations, even, and we may touch on the positive side of some of these things uh, in this podcast, it can work to help possibly increase property values, maintain uniformity, and, you know, some of those other things that governments and other regulatory boards over the years have found to possibly be beneficial on the whole to a community. Um, But at the same time, there's a cost of those things. And I think that's where it plays in for the investors, you know, What is this costing me to have these kinds of controls and restrictions and things on my property? Is it going to allow me to do what I want to do and maximize the value and my return on investment? Or is it going to cause me to consider whether or not I should liquidate these properties that have these kinds of prohibitive restrictions on them? Yeah, that's right. Because when you own a piece of property, right, you own the land, right? But what you really own is the use of the property, the, the entitlements that come with it, the utility, right? Because, you know, let's think about it this way. If you own a piece of land and it's a swamp, right, there's a limited number of things you can do with a piece of swamp land, right? There's just practical limitations. and There's probably environmental limitations, too. That piece of swamp land is nowhere near as valuable as a piece of prime high and dry inner city, let's say, with access piece of property, because in that section, in that piece of property, you can do a bunch of things with it, right? Now, you're restricted by all kinds of laws and codes on what you can do with a variety of different properties. And so if you own a home that's affected by deed restrictions, or a homeowners association, or a CDD, or if you're a part of any kind of municipal area where they actually put thought into what their land use is, then all of those use rights are restricted, like sequentially they're restricted more and more substantially as you get into a more established area. And that definitely affects the long-term profitability of that property for you. So, I mean, I think all this starts at the zoning level, if I'm not mistaken, right, Chase? So, so maybe we should just address that just a little bit. You know, what are we dealing with when we have zoning as an issue? I mean, what is that, what kind of constraints does that put on us? Yeah, you know, zoning is probably at the highest level, you know, the, the roadmap or the vision that the municipality, whether it be a city, a county, or a state, you know, has for any particular parcel or piece of land in a particular area. And, 
whether it's done residential, agricultural, commercial, multifamily, single family, all has an impact on what can be built there and what the you know culture or the fabric of that community is going to look like. Um, municipalities that have done a really good job with zoning and planning for their land use uh, will provide investors with really good uniformity in areas. Um, they'll see just single family homes that are very similar in style and size, lot size, home size in areas. Um, they'll see commercial districts that are well planned out, all in concentrated areas, usually around high traffic highways and things like that. All of those things are really good for a community because the principle of uniformity uh, tends to provide stabilization in the value uh, of the property in those areas. And so um, it's one thing that's a positive that municipalities have been able to do. Now, when you talk about vacant land and trying to develop parcels and things like that, which I think we'll get to in maybe a later episode, that's where it comes in into this idea of, well, can I do what I want with my land? You know, is the county or the city or the state going to prevent me from doing something that will provide me with my max ROI? Right. And it's hard, it's hard to know, right? I mean, some of these plans have been put in place years and years ago, right? And they, they keep boards over many of these future plans so that they can dust them off every now and then and reassess that they're making the right general decisions. But they are just people, and there's lots and lots of land in any given area, right? So they might make a mistake. But overall, in, in, in our areas at least, I've looked at these uh, future land use plans pretty extensively, and they do a really good job at kind of reflecting the spirit of what the citizenry want, right? So in a certain area, let's say uh, East Hillsborough County area, the citizenry out there want more rural plots, more rural development. And so what you find when you look at the future land use plan is a plan that reflects uh, the zoning laws that kind of re- that kind of uh, encourages zoning of those areas uh, to allow for nice rural type development. And if your plan was to go into that area and build industrial space, that would contradict with what the what the planners, what the uh, citizen planners have put in place, and they would likely not want that there. And for good reasons, because everything they're trying to do is to maximize the the aesthetic and the use and the ultimately the value of that land. So you're not going to be o- able to overturn uh, a lot of future land uses, and you shouldn't even want to because in most cases, if your county was well run, they make a lot of sense. But what I've found is that even in counties that are very well run, there are, some t- there are sometimes some really strong citizen coalitions that come in and say, okay, I... The county has said we can do rural stuff here, but we want to go even further and say the rural stuff should be at least an acre of lot size per single family unit. Or we we don't want to have municipal utilities brought here, and so every facility needs to have its own well, and that will prevent some density of construction along commercial corridors. And so those citizen coalitions can be very powerful in continuing to help shape the future land use of plans. And although those are not elected bodies, Donnie, I have seen citizen coalitions rise up and completely, you know, eviscerate commercial plans and even residential plans that were perfectly compliant with the zoning, because the uh, boards of uh, the the permitting boards consider so highly those opinions of citizens who want to say, "I don't want my neighborhood." to go more dense or to go in a direction that this plan would potentially take it. So they've got lots and lots of power, even though it's not official. Yeah, you know, the name of the game for real estate investors when it comes to land development is density, right? And so to maximize your return on investment, you want the biggest density quotient you can get for your piece of property. And that would mean you'd want to build an apartment complex on every single square inch of dirt that you own. And unfortunately, we just can't do that everywhere we want to do it because we're in a single family zoning or an ag zoning or rural zoning or whatever the case might be. Um, And that that's really the the crux for the real estate investor looking to develop land is, you know, how can I maximize my density when it comes to rental real estate? Because density equals cash flow. And, um, you know, that's uh, that's something I think. Yeah, we'll delve into that later. We don't need to talk about a whole lot of details on that today. Just to put that out there that we understand the power lies with the government and what we can do with our property. We can't just do whatever we want. Um, that would be nice. But there are reasons why we have these uh, rules and regs in place. And overall, they are for the betterment of the community. Yeah, you know, so we were speaking a little bit off mic before we started this podcast. 
and we were talking about the power of you know organizations like HOAs and citizen coalitions and so forth. And you know, I, I understood. You know, obviously, me being a, a real estate investor, I'm beholden to the bank because they they hold a mortgage on my house typically. Uh, if you're financing, obviously, and then you're beholden to the government to pay your property taxes, right? Because you can have a fully paid off house and still get it taken away from you, right? I mean, the government, you know, if you don't pay your property taxes, they can seize that from you. And then we were talking about how, you know, HOAs can actually place liens and foreclose on your house. Now, that's something, me being a, a relatively young real estate investor, I didn't even realize that, that they held that much power. And you guys were talking about these citizen coalitions and the community planning and uh, putting on even more restrictions upon zoning restrictions. Um, coming from my California context, I don't want to derail us at all, but, you know, that, that's become quite a problem, just this uh, anti-development nimbyism that's going on where, yeah, they don't want density, they don't want, you know, shopping centers and so forth. I mean, that's, that's the context I'm coming from. Yeah, it is a problem. Right, and what we're what we want to resist, and what every local uh, area wants to resist, is like an unbridled activism where just the loudest voice can control uh, what people can do with their property, and that's why these future land plans are are codified. Right, they're put in place, and they're put in place with thought, and there there's lots of sunshine on them. Everyone ha- can have a say in, in terms of, of how these plans are put in place, and they're out there, and they're reviewed frequently. So. Uh, you know, that is the governing law that, that governs how land can be used. Uh, but citizen coalitions do have power. And there, are, there is power that the, that the local municipalities and that the state allows for things like HOAs and, and institutions, quasi-municipal uh, institutions like community development districts. And they certainly do have an immense power in certain areas. And enough, like you said, to be able to foreclose on your property and take it from you. But these are all layers on top of that zoning that was initially set. Um, And even before you get to some of those constricting factors, I can't get my words out today, you've got like potentially deed restrictions that are affecting your community too. And those come from, you know, developers or whoever it was who first built on your land because they're the ones who put in place a, a set of laws in terms of, you know, how that land should practically be used and that rides above zoning. So, yeah, lots of authorities that you've got to succumb to as an investor. So, yeah, what is a deed restriction? Does that mean only owner occupants, or what does that mean? Well, let's let's remember too that all of this stuff we're talking about is all political. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it was all created by political bodies. Um, no matter what the zoning is or regulations there, um, before we really dive into the deed restriction thing, just remember that. Everything is lobbied for. Everything is political. At the end of the day, like here in Hillsborough County, the county commissioners who are elected by the people have the final say on any and all zoning, planning, even even with uh, community planning and citizen boards that have established these plans. It's all political. Hmm. So things have been moved in the past. Things can be changed. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. But it's all political. And deed restrictions often come into play in a political realm as well, where people want to be protective of an area that they live in or they have a piece of land they're looking to develop and they want it developed a certain way um, with certain types of houses or certain types of commercial establishments or things like that. And so they can put deed restrictions on the actual parcels of, of land that they're selling to be developed. And we see this all over the place. And anyone can do this from an individual that owns one single lot to a developer developing 100 acres to, you know, somebody that's going to develop a quarter acre piece of commercial property on a main highway. Um, Deed restrictions are something that anyone can put on a piece of property simply by filing those restrictions for that property with the clerk of the court here locally. Okay, so if I personally own a parcel, I could put a deed restriction on it and say only a single-family house can be built on this. Yeah, as long as it did not conflict with zoning law or any other municipal laws regarding that property, you could put that restriction on it. And you could even dictate the size of that single-family home that that you wanted to be built on there, greater than or less than a square footage. You can dictate, you know the style of it, whether it's Mediterranean or modern or craftsman bungalow style, you can dictate pretty much anything you want. 
and that's a pawn sale, and whoever buys that has to follow that. That's right. Can they? It has to be disclosed on the sale, but yeah, that that would that would pass on to the next owner. They can't appeal that somehow, or is there any way around that? Uh, yeah, they can be appealed, and, and if they're found to be um, outrageous or not in line with zoning and planning laws or things like that, there's a possibility for them to be removed. But by and large, when people buy into a deed-restricted area or community or a particular piece of land, um, they're stepping into something that's been well-crafted by attorneys that you know is going to hold up in any kind of court battle. Hmm. Okay. So, um, so okay, so just me trying to wrap my head around this. We have the zoning, we have the land use, and then we have people placing deed restrictions trying to form these communities. Is that, is that that's sort of how it goes? So how do HOAs fit into all that? We'll be back after a quick break. We hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, deed restrictions are kind of the genesis of homeowners associations. Um, homeowners associations are a deed restriction. So you buy in a community, one of your deed restrictions would be that you have to be a part of the homeowners association. Mm. And as part of that homeowners association, you have to subscribe to what we call the CCRs, which are the covenants, conditions, and restrictions of the uh, community. And, um, and so those are a whole different set of rules and laws that then also buy, become de facto deed restrictions um, on the property that you buy. And that HOA is then governed by a board. And as a member of the HOA, you can run for the board. You can choose to be as active as you want. But that's kind of how all that begins. Okay. So, yeah, I've never lived in an HOA. I've never invested in an HOA. I mean, I only know, you know, stereotypes from TV and stuff. I mean, just... You know, angry people that yell at you for leaving your trash out an extra day. Yeah. Um, it, so can we can we expand on that a little bit? Yeah, that's uh, are they are they everything you've ever stereotyped? Right? <laughs> Possibly yes, depending on which one you live in. Right? So oftentimes you have people who run for the boards. You know, they got to run for them, and you can imagine not everyone in a community wants to be on the board. Right? It's a you're there to enforce the covenants of the community. You're there to enforce the deed restrictions, to, to make sure the community stays uh, in conformity, right, and uniform, because those are things that supposedly maximize value. And so the boards of the HOAs have a value-maximizing uh, objective, and they try to do that with the tools that are given to them. But you can imagine that that's hard to do. It's hard to control people, right? And so what they're trying to do is as impose and control the regulations that exist for things like the color of your house mm-hmm. and the state of your lawn and whether or not your trash cans have been brought in or not and whether or not you can see your personal property through your windows and you know there's a variety of different things that can all be applied to there and so they get a reputation for being a little militaristic um, a little imposing on your freedoms that you have some people on those boards who are just going to make your life miserable if you haven't like got your flower beds weeded or your shrubs aren't to a certain height. And all of that happens. Yes, every one of those things are things that we've had to deal with. And we've owned investment properties in HOA communities, and our violation notices come in hot and heavy. I mean, they just all the time. Now, no matter who you've got living in a property, you've got a good renter and they're conscientious, but they leave the trash can out too long and the inspector comes by and lo and behold, you've got a letter in the mail saying your trash can was left out too long. Please bring it in. It's your first violation notice. So, not fun. <laughs> or my favorite, the mailbox is dirty. Oh, and yeah. It needs to be wiped down. You know, yeah. you never know what you're going to find. Clean your mailbox. You know, one thing that's interesting though is like, HOA's have been around forever. I mean, 1905, you ever imagine that these things started in 1905 in, in Pasadena, a suburb of L.A.? You know, and, and the people back then, you had these wealthy people spreading out into the suburbs of, of Los Angeles. 
they wanted to build these upscale, really nice looking, beautiful neighborhoods. And they wanted to make sure that riffraff didn't move in. Somebody didn't bring a mobile home in there, you know, and somebody didn't paint their house, you know, neon green, right? And uh, that's what they did. And they, they're the ones that started this whole craze. But today, what, what it is in reality for us, let's say here in the Tampa Bay area, is that you've got major developers, right, that come in. You've got the Pulte, Syntex, Lennar, the R. Hortons, right? They're building neighborhoods. And how many different kinds of houses do they build? Like two or three, right? All the houses pretty much look the same with flopped garages or, you know, a second story added on or something like that. They paint them all the same colors, maybe like three color palettes, and they look all nice and uniform. It's what they used to call ticky tacky, right? And people buy these homes and they buy them for different reasons. But when they come into the community to buy them, they're buying something that all looks the same. Right? And so in order to preserve that, to continue to allow people to experience what they first bought from a developer, the developer puts this HOA in place. And at first it's controlled by the developer. And the developer wants to preserve that same look and likeness for all the buyers that are going to come in. And then pretty soon they don't care anymore because they've sold out the community. And they turn the HOA over to the citizens that now live in this community. But it's really a self-preservation tactic up front by these developers. And then it's carried on by the people that live in the neighborhood. And how they carry it on is really what's in question and what becomes possibly a problem for investors. And so let's explore some of those things. We've already talked about trash cans, mailboxes, pressure washing sidewalks, you know. What are some other experiences you've had, Peter, with this uh, as a problem for an investor that costs us money all the time? Well, where it goes, of course, is that, you know, you have an issue like lawn. And in Florida, we've got, we've got a dry season, right? So you've got a period of time where rain isn't falling. And so what happens if your sprinkler breaks and you're not irrigating your lawn and rain isn't falling and you've got a tenant living in the property? Then the lawn dies, right? And when the lawn dies, it's a very costly replacement. And so the owner gets a notice in the mail that they have excessive weeds and dead spots in their lawn and they need to cure it, they need to get it revived again. But you can't just water and weed kill a lawn and get it revived again. That's literally a sod replacement job, which even in a small community, in a community with small properties, that's a two and a half thousand dollar job. It can't so, be done in May. There's no rain. And it can't be done in rain unless you've got an irrigation system that works. So now you've got to put an irrigation system in and you got to resod. And yeah, if, if it's in May and you can't afford those two things, then... What do you do? Well, here's some of the things that, here's some of the nightmare scenarios, right? The owner gets that violation notice. He can't afford to put in uh, an irrigation system. He really can't afford the sod. So he drags his feet waiting and hoping that the rainy season will come and the grass will start growing again. And he handpicks some weeds, right? But then they send an inspector. The HOA sends a second inspector by. And the lawn is still not fixed. So they issue a second notice of violation. And this time that notice of violation says, you've got 30 days to cure this. And if you don't, this is going to our attorneys. And our attorney will, will, ex- will require enforcement using legal methods. And all these legal methods are authorized in the HOA CCRs. So by buying in that community, you have obliged yourself to keep the rules and to subject yourself to their enforcement methods, right? So their enforcement method is an attorney. And, and the dry season protracts and the owner still can't afford to replace the lawn. And so 30 days passes and he gets a letter from an attorney. And that attorney says, you have a very short period of time to totally cure this problem or we'll commence foreclosure on your property. Well, all of a sudden, now the owner has to put a new irrigation system in, replace the sod, pay for any HOA fines that might have accrued, and pay legal expenses because an attorney is involved. And the minute that document goes to the attorney, that owner pays an additional $1,000 in fine, at least, for every time a letter is received. And that clock is just ticking. You can imagine it. There's entire HOA enforcement attorney groups that are out there billing attorneys lots of money to help them enforce their regs. And so the owner now has a far bigger bill they've got to pay. And they've got a a shorter time than ever to do it. And if they can't get it done on time to the satisfaction of the HOA, they issue foreclosure documents. And and they can actually do that. You're telling me that if I got weeds in my lawn, you know... Within like 60 days, not only is it going to cost me like four grand to replace my lawn, maybe even another like two grand to put in an irrigation system, 
but then I'm going to have legal bills of like another two or three thousand dollars to the HOA if I don't get this done. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I got a quote from from the sod guy who told me not to do this till November because right. that's when you replace sod in Florida. But the HOA thing has got to be done in May when yeah. it doesn't rain. I know it's 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 shocking. It makes you outraged and incredulous, but it's exactly what happens. And we have had owners. So I can describe the scenario, another nightmare scenario. Give me a second to do it. An owner that had a situation where they couldn't afford to make their make these some of these repairs. Actually, they couldn't afford to pay one month of of their HOA fee, and so they postponed that one month while they kind of got their act together. But but then a sinkhole opened under their property. It was like the perfect storm, and the sinkhole took away their rental income. Right, so they weren't able to rent. The tenant had to move out, and now they're behind a month on their HOA fees. Their property is not income producing anymore, so they can't make the fees. The legal expenses are mounting. The HOA actually commences foreclosure on the properties. And, uh, and well, this guy in particular had to default on his mortgages. And between his default on his mortgages and the legal fees was unable to keep the properties. All because of this overbearing structure in this case, because he didn't abide by the rules and regs. Hey there, it's Peter Murphy with buying Tampa Bay. Are you an investor who has ever wanted to own real estate in Tampa Bay? Or do you currently have real estate and want to grow your portfolio, add a few new investment properties? Or maybe you just need some awesome property management to de-stress your life. Well, here's what I found. HomeProp is hands down the best real estate investment brokerage in Tampa Bay. And they can help you build wealth in real estate, which is right in line with our podcast mission to build wealth in real estate and not just Wealth is in dollars and cents, but in the quality of your life, the quality of your community, and just enriching uh, enriching what exists around you. So you want to learn more? Click on the link to Home Prop in the podcast description and give them a shot. Sounds like HOAs don't use any common sense. I mean, who would do that to someone? I mean, that's crazy, right? Yeah, But it it happens every day. Like, I've been the beneficiary of one of these tyrant HOAs, I was able to buy a really cool looking PVC fence from my backyard about 10 years ago when I lived in an HOA because this homeowner in Land Lakes, unbeknownst to him, hadn't got the exact model number of the fence that was allowed by the HOA to be installed in his backyard. He looked at the options and saw white picket fences and thought, why can't you just get any white picket fence You know that, that looks similar to this? No, no. He got one that was slightly different than the actual pictures allowed and was forced to sell his fence to me on Craigslist for half of what it was worth. I happily obliged, went and picked it up and installed it in my yard because it was approved by my HOA. Well, or try painting your house a color that is not the exact approved color palette for the HOA. You are going to be repainting your house. You, they will force you to do it even if the paint job is brand new because you didn't abide by the architectural standard for the community. But to, well, hold on a second. Don't you have to fill out an application just to paint your house? Yes, right? you have do. I heard about that right? I yeah, think so. <laughs> that's right. And to put a fence up, right? And pay a fee sometimes. Uh-huh. So someone can look at the architectural standards and make sure you've made the right decision in what you're, do- what you're planning for your home. And you must abide by that process. You know, so not only do you have to do that for architectural standards, but there are restrictions on rentals, right? Which is a very big problem. Let's say you have a renter you want to rent your property to. And so you do a lease with your renter and you move the renter in. But unbeknownst to you, there is a requirement in your HOA that the HOA must approve your rental, uh, your renter. And they have to approve your lease. Well, the HOA has authority to require you to avoid the lease and move the tenant out. Resolve that problem because you've already got a lease on your hands. You know, you're going to evict the tenant with a bona fide lease because the HOA says you have to. You've got a nightmare on your hands. Yeah, one thing we will point out here, though, is a lot of HOAs like to overstep their authority. They like, just because all the other HOAs are doing it, boards of HOAs sometimes will say, hey, let's start an application and approval process for tenants and owners. When if you actually look at the CCRs, they have no authority to do that. And so we happen to own some properties in a community like this where every time they tell us, hey, we need your application for these tenants. They need to pay $45 a piece. I kindly say, no, thank you. You're not authorized to do that. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Unless it's in the CCRs, they can't do it. And they often try, right? So 
that's a that's something to be aware of. They also try, and I'll say this, I know you're getting ready to ask a question, Donnie, but let me say this. They try to impose a rental restriction, and the law, fair housing, requires that anyone trying to do that must disclose the qualifying criteria for their renters. So if an HOA is attempting to screen your renter and rule a either for or against them living in the community. They're required by law to show what the standard is by, by which they're making that uh, discriminating decision. Mm-hmm. And if they don't do that, they're in viola- they're, it's a fair housing violation for them. So they're not ironclad, but boy, do they have power. Yeah, the way I understand it, um, I have heard of HOAs requiring like some kind of interview for possible tenants or people that want to move into the neighborhood. But my real question was... Um, Looking at this in a property management perspective, because I know, you know, in a typical property management scenario, you know, you're towing the line between the owner, the investor, and the tenant, right? And then you have to navigate both of those things. And it sounds like with this, not only that, but you have to navigate your relationship with the HOA. You know, like what you said with your, you know, it's not written in the CCR, so thus you cannot do it. It sounds like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes... You do want to push it, push against the HOA, or maybe you don't want to get into that adversarial relationship with somebody that you know you're going to have, you know, a long term communication with. What What do you guys think about that? The PM's role in dealing with HOAs. Well, as someone who's supposed to be the expert in the area, you know, especially you know when it comes to you know condo communities, single family home communities governed by HOAs that are managed by companies that manage multiple HOAs, you should be pretty well accustomed to how they operate. You know, the same HOA management company typically does things similarly throughout all the communities they manage. As a property manager for an owner, there's a couple things to consider. One is, uh, did you help this owner acquire this property in this HOA? If you help them acquire the property in the HOA, I think there's a little bit more burden on you to have made sure that the owner understands, number one, can he even rent the property? We've run into this a lot lately where you know, HOAs have put restrictions on rental period, where they've put one-year waiting periods after ownership transfer to be able to rent the property. Some of them have outlawed rentals, all, or tried, I should say, to outlaw rentals altogether in certain communities. Um, you've got to know that stuff. You should be reviewing the CCRs in some way, shape, or form on any property that you manage for an owner to make sure that they're not, they're not in a violation of compliance with what's going on there. Um, you can't just take their word for it because sometimes owners really don't understand the nuts and bolts of what the HOA can and can't do to them or to their tenant. But as a property manager... We really need to know that stuff, especially in the communities of the areas in which we work routinely. Um, and, and so having a really good knowledge of how not only a management company works, what the tendencies of the board are, and what the rules and regulations for that community are, are extremely important. Do uh, separate boards, do they have like their own personalities, like more hawkish and more dovish boards? Would without a doubt. Yep. Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Communities... Uh, will have different presidents, right? And some of those presidents will have existed forever in that role, and that president very often sets the tone for what that board acts like, right? That board president, I should say. They'll set the tone for what that board acts like. Maybe they're very hawkish. They go after every violation, uh, you know, stridently. And they do that because they are trying to apply the laws of the regs consistently. They don't want anyone to accuse them of a unequal enforcement of regs, right? Mm-hmm. So that's often why they have to go take the most stringent course of action every time a violation comes up, lest they be accused of uneven, of uneven enforcement. Um, but on the other hand, there are some communities that have some sensitivities to hard times or you know, just different, you know, the different needs of, of the people who live in that community. They understand maybe that their residents are not affluent and can't afford to do high, high levels of repairs and improvements to their properties. But uh, most of the time, we find that associations are going to try to impose the highest standard of conformity because the people who go and use their valuable time to be on a board are often people with a little bit more expendable time, Mm -hmm. right? Expendable income. And they want to hold everyone to the same standard that they feel they're being held to as well. 
And to maximize values of a home, that's important. I mean, I think we should address that, right? Because there is something in us that drives through a neighborhood where you have, well, here's a lawn that's totally overgrown, and here's a pink house, right? And here's a fence that's lying down. And even if that's not the majority, maybe it's a small number of homes in that community, we don't feel like that community is going in the right direction, right? We feel like there goes the neighborhood. There's something like that happening, and now we're concerned that people are going to start some flight from that community or that other homes will also stop caring. And so certainly there's a principle here, there is an instinct here that HOAs, when they can mandate and maintain standards, will help keep the community from going into blight. And that's what they're trying to do. So it's an important it's an important ultimatum that they have, right, to try and do that for the owners who live in that community. But certainly there's different levels of enforcement. So maybe maybe one question to ask then is, what is the ideal makeup of an HOA board? Because we've already t- touched on the fact that if you've got someone that's power hungry, who aggressively runs for office, they get the presidency of the HOA, or they're the head of the finding committee, or they're the head of the architectural review committee, you could have some problems on your hands because this person is intent on exercising some power and control over everyone else in the community. That's obviously not the intent of why these things were put in place in the first place. But it's also why the personalities that are on your board are vitally important to how the community will run. It is important that we have uniformity. It is important that everyone takes care of their home, takes care of their lawn, that we can preserve value for homes in the community. But you also don't want to be an irritant as an HOA board to the rest of the people that live in your community. When you become an irritant, it just makes everyone angry and the culture of your community and then the reputation of your community is tarnished, which can also affect property values. No investor and no real, really no even a homeowner wants to buy in a community that's known for having a tyrant type HOA board. It's just a pain in the rear that will end up costing you money and you're going to have to continually comply with nonsensical demands by people that are trying to control you. And that's, that's the danger, right? That's the thing that we all try to guard against. So what does a really good HOA board look like? And I would encourage anyone that's an investor in a community to get on the HOA board if you can. Because more than likely, there will not be an investor on the board. Investors are typically passive. They're typically not wanting to spend their time involved in community politics, which is how they view the HOA board. But I'll tell you, if investors don't have a voice on the board you're more likely to be run by some neighborhood vigilantes that are going to be looking at your property as a tenant-occupied home and targeting you for violations. Um, I think throughout this episode, that age-old quote keeps flashing through my head, absolute power corrupts absolutely. (laughs) You got it. Well, it does. I mean, and, and if you're an investor in a community, find out from the, through the grapevine in every way you can who are the militant, tyrannical HOAs and don't buy there. For a long time, there was a community up in Pasco County that had a horrible time. It went through just a terrible state of foreclosure after the housing market crashed, and they had a ton of dilapidated homes. And one man who had bought in there at the height of the, height of the home, I mean, uh, you know, by goodness, he was not going to let that community go to waste and sink because he'd spent a lot of money on his home, and he wasn't going to get foreclosed on. He was one of the few homes that didn't get foreclosed on. But that guy successfully fought every single short sale and foreclosure leaned almost every single one of them and was able to like substantially enrich the coffers of the community for substantial improvements on roads and landscaping and roofs. And every time a home sold, they had to replace the roof and paint the outside because this guy was so successful at forcing that kind of behavior. Well, of course, his absolute power did corrupt. And in the end, he was indicted for, I think it was taking kickbacks from the vendors he was using to get roofs and paint jobs done on all these foreclosed homes. So, yes, there's, there's a sad part to that story. But he helped his community bounce back. And that strong board totally helped it recover for a long time. So Yeah, we, we shouldn't also underestimate the role of the HOA manager in all of this. Because the HOA manager is the one who guides the board a lot of times. 
you know, the board is made up of members of that community. The HOA manager is hired as a third party person to carry out the wishes of the board and to enforce the CCRs of the community. And those managers are compensated variably sometimes. Sometimes there's incentive among the manager, depending on what contract they have, for more violations to go out because they're getting paid per violation. Hmm. If you can imagine. I mean, like, they're not really there to do their job. They're there to see how many violations they can come up with because that's how they're patting their pockets. Um, there, there's various things like that. And so, you know, more than just, I, I know the question that any investor always asks when you're looking to acquire a property, well, how much is the HOA fee? How much per month, per quarter, per year am I going to have to pay to this HOA thing that's hanging out here that I don't really like, right? That's only one part of the equation. You need to know who the manager is. You need to know what their contract looks like. You need to know your CCRs. And you need to know the board. And then, like I mentioned earlier, get on that board because that's the only way you can have any impact on what's going on in the community. And you can see, in a worst-case scenario, how a power-hungry HOA board works with an ill-incentivized manager to make everyone's life miserable through this violation process. And, And then also, every time they turn a case over to the attorney... The attorney is referring business to that HOA manager. I guarantee it. And in part, the HOA manager is sending violations to the attorney who gets to rack up a $2,000 attorney fee every time one hits his desk. So there are a lot of perverse relationships sometimes that happen within these structures that you need to be aware of. Because like Peter mentioned earlier, go on vacation for two or three weeks, turn your head, you know, put your violation notice on the side of your desk because you've got other stuff going on. And before you know it, you got a two, $3,000 bill hitting you in the face. Um, more than your property taxes sometimes. So uh, it's important to be informed and be involved in what is going on with the HOAs and the communities that you invest in. You know, it, on, on one hand, there's a lot of and justified fear, justifiable fear about HOAs, uh, but they're lovely. You drive through many HOAs, and they have gone to great lengths to make a beautiful living experience for most of their residents. And most folks don't buy into these kinds of communities blind, right? You know what you're getting. You kind of know that you're going to get an HOA. If, if you see a beautiful standard uh, in most of the homes, you can know for sure that you either got extremely conscientious homeowners with great uniformity, or you've got a strong board in, 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 in enforcing the regulations, and it's probably the latter. So, you know, we're, we know what we're getting into, in other words, when we buy into this. Um, so do remember that. But also remember, like, I think HOAs get a kind of a bad rap because a well-managed HOA is all about rule enforcement, but a well-managed municipality is doing the same thing. You go to some cities, and you'll see wonderful, beautiful streets, communities, homes with nicely manicured lawns and maintained trees, and you don't see the level of degradation that we were talking about early on. And you know what's going on there, right? They don't have an HOA in a lot of cases. In our, in our community, you know, Temple Terrace proper is, is a good example of that, right? You drive through parts of Temple Terrace, and it's lovely and very well ma- ma- managed. And they don't have an HOA doing it. What they have, and which all the owners are, are, are beholden to, is just a good code enforcement board, right? And so whether you live in an HOA or whether you just live in a part of town, there's someone watching over your home and trying to make sure you're taking good care of it. And a lot of times it's a code enforcement board. And when those guys do their job, they can be just as challenging to work with as an HOA. And I say that in kind of like a, an enforcement, from an enforcement standpoint. Um, they have just as many rights to impose fines and foreclose on you as an HOA does. And they have just the same power to require you to take good care of your property. So you don't have to have an HOA, but you always have someone who's an authority over you if you're an investor. It's kind of got you get used to that reality. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that. You know, I think um, you've kind of had a, <laughs> a pile on on the HOAs on this episode, but I appreciate you saying, I mean, because um, there are some pros to being an HOA, HOA, right? I mean, just the original design behind it, pro- protecting property values. If I you know, invested a large sum of money into a house, I'd like to see that, you know, I'm putting a certain amount of, I'm putting commitment into that house. I'd like to see the same from the neighbors, whether I'm an investor or not. Is there any other, what do you think? Any yeah. other pros for investors investing in HOAs? 
Well, they are often, if they're developed correctly, they're often in areas where school districts are good, mm-hmm. where retail is very strong. They're often parts of master planned communities. And sometimes you have an HOA that is accompanied by a CDD. Here's another acronym, right? And the CDD is a community development district. And that is a, that is a situation where something needed to be done to uh, some substantial infrastructure improvements needed to happen in order to make, make a community possible. And so a quasi-municipal board was set up with a taxing authority to be able to build long and big roads and beautiful boulevards and lavish golf courses and wonderful swimming pools that are resort-like and country clubs and all those things you come to expect in Florida communities. Those were funded by a community development district, and they have sub-HOAs inside of them. And they have often schools that have been built out within those communities. And those schools, because they're sometimes affluent, are very well rated. And so the people who buy homes in those communities are sending their kids to the best schools. And then lo and behold, all the best restaurants come and you've got all the retail you want. And it's just a wonderful, self-contained lifestyle within a very small radius. And so yes, if you want to buy a, buy a home in a community where you can have a reasonable, strong expectation of value preservation, buying in a community like this is a good way to do it. As you buy in a community with poor code enforcement or poor deed restriction enforcement, and you might experience a decline in your home's value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, one other thing, too, about HOAs is, other than the uniformity, you know, maintenance of homes, preservation of value concept, um, is amenities. Uh, you know, a lot of people can't afford to put in, like, their own swimming pool or have a really nice playground for their kids or can't have fancy street lights, you know, in front of their house or things like that, and these are all things that HOAs provide um, for residents in a community. Um, they're done by the developer, obviously, when the community's built. And we're talking more of the newer construction type communities now. But having things like a community pool, clubhouse, playgrounds, you know, dog parks, things like that, those are all shared amenities. And really the only way to govern shared amenities like that within a community is to have a, a body that supervises that and then regulates that and then shares the cost of that among the people that live in the community. And so if you want to be in an area that has amenities like that, you know, HOA is where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times you can get a lot of bang for your buck with that. You know, you, you may be paying, you know, anywhere from 50 to $400 a month for your HOA, but that usually depends on what amenities you're getting, you know. Tennis courts, pools, spas, clubhouse, playgrounds, you know, street lights, even sometimes water is included um, in your HOA fee that you pay every month. So you really need to look at kind of what you're getting and, you know, what the value proposition is behind that HOA with that too. So there are some really, really nice benefits sometimes to that. And CDDs often in the community development districts are the ones that are responsible for putting a lot of these larger scale amenities into developments up front. And so um, we just briefly touched on this idea of CDD and some of the control they might have, but um, CDDs were put in place back starting in in 1980 in Florida uh, to allow developers to make communities really nice, to put golf courses in, to put massive clubhouses and pools and recreation centers and all of these wonderful amenities that the builder wanted to put in to provide a higher standard of living for people, to put beautiful monument signs and, you know, architectural street lights and extra wide roads with nice curbs and sidewalks and bike lanes and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's paid for by CDDs issuing, you know, multi-million dollar bonds that then all the residents of the community end up paying back over the course of 20, 25, 30 years, depending on what the bond is, um, as a portion of their property tax. And so um, you may have a CDD, you may have a CDD and an HOA, which is very common, um, but both of those entities are established and put in place to not only preserve and help grow property value, but to provide residents in those communities with something more than what they would get if they weren't there. And the CDD fees, they're baked into property taxes? Is that right? They are. They're assessed right alongside your uh, municipal property taxes. Okay. Um, There's a separate line item under the non-ad valorem portion. That's pretty cool. So, 
I mean, it's the cost of doing business. You want to go into a beautiful community that has great uniformity and good property values, you got to pay those fees, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And we don't discourage investors from buying in HOAs necessarily, right? I mean, the wrong ones we do discourage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the economics are what need to drive these decisions. And if you find that uh, you have a home that you can rent for more money, even though you might have a higher HOA fee or a higher tax basis because of your CDD, well, then maybe that still works, right? Maybe that's still a good investment. And maybe you have a reasonable certainty of, of the fact that the home value will remain strong or appreciate more regularly because of the level of enforcement of regs. Well, both of those are good things for investments, and so we wouldn't necessarily discourage it. A vigilante HOA, a overly uh, strict leasing policy, um, a community with HOA fees that seem wild and out of control from year to year because sometimes they are. You'll get a renewal and it's just crazy high one year. Uh, so as the community ages, for example, insurance costs will accelerate and those costs get passed on to the members of the community, right? If you're in a condo, of course, uh, really anything. But uh, where you really feel it is if you own a condo. And so if those are the kind of uh, economic realities that your home might be facing, then that's not a community we would recommend an, in an investor invest in. Uh, but overall, we'll take these, uh, we'll take investments in HOA managed communities and we'll consider them favorably in a lot of cases for investors. Yeah, you know, one thing we do in our advisory role when we're working with investors here at HomeProp to help them decide whether or not they should buy in an HOA is reviewing the financial statements that the HOA is required to put out. The state of Florida requires that they publish at least annual budgets and financial statements for any owners um, of properties in the community. And so if you're looking to buy one, your seller should provide that to you. And you want to review liquidity. I mean, one issue that we had back in, you know, 2008, 9, 10, was a lot of these homeowners associations were becoming illiquid because the default rate on people paying dues, either because of foreclosures or the unemployment or just skipping out of town and just leaving the house to the bank, skyrocketed and it left HOAs in a very vulnerable cash position. So you want to make sure that any HOA is financially sound and liquid because if they're not, you're going to bear the brunt of the sins of the people that lived there before you mm -hmm. in the form of what they call a special assessment. Because one way or another, the HOA has to pay its bills and if it doesn't have any cash, guess where it's going to get that cash? It's going to get it from you hmm. as the owner. Current owners. The current owner, yes. Um, Not the past. So those guys got off stock for, scot free if they hadn't been paying their, uh, their funding their obligations correctly. Yeah, and one of those is reserves, right? I mean, reserves are vitally important, right? Every HOA is responsible for maintaining some asset, whether it's just simply street lights or a playground or if it's a massive swimming pool, golf course, clubhouse, whatever. Every HOA is responsible for that. And so there's upkeep. There's capital expenditure that must be made to keep these things up over the years. And so typically, hopefully, every HOA is going to have a reserve schedule for maintaining those assets. And you want to make sure that the HOA has baked into the monthly dues, quarterly dues, whatever they are, a payment to the reserve fund that is adequate to cover those things when they will become obsolete or depleted or in need of massive repair. You know, so there's some things financially like that that you really want to analyze an HOA in, within an HOA to make sure, okay, this HOA is sound and therefore it'd be a good investment because I'm not at risk of being special assessed with a $2,000 bill this year because of the failure of prior owners to pay their bills. Yeah, well, that's great. I know we had a, a hard stop at 12.30, so I think uh, it'll be safe to wrap it up. But just, just a, a quick recap, I mean, talking to an investor that's looking at HOAs, I was able to glean a couple golden nuggets in this episode, and I guess what they really ought to do is talk to their property manager, ask them, you know, what is the characteristics of this board that they're entering into a relationship with, check out their CCR, make sure to read that so that they know what they're obligated to and what their rights are, and if and then check the financial statements like we just said. Make sure that they're in good financial standing. And if possible, join that board so that they can have a voice as an investor. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I think if an investor does all of those things, they'll have well covered their basis and done, done their due diligence. Yeah. yeah. 
That's great. That's, I mean, that was huge value to me, and I'm sure it will be to the listeners. All right, well, I guess that's it. Good <laughs> stuff. <Very> good. <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting, I think, as time goes on, to develop out, you know, really good intros and outros. Yeah. And that would make sense. Maybe those are pre-recorded. 